Father God, we thank you and praise you for giving us this opportunity once again as your redeemed people to come and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the glorious reality that you will hold us fast by grace through faith in Jesus. And uh, Lord, because of this great uh, privilege, great reality, we come before you to offer our praise and adoration. And Lord, we ask now that as we particularly look at your word from the book of 1 Samuel, that you would, as always, uh, shine forth your blessing upon it, such that we would glean insight from it, that we would understand it more, and that we would then, uh, by your grace, be able to apply it in every area of our life, whatever we may happen to do uh, this afternoon and then going out into this week, that you would apply it and convict our hearts with it so that we would become ever increasingly sanctified and Christ-like in our thinking, in our words, and in our actions. For Lord, you alone have the power to give this gift, and so we're asking for it now in the good name of Jesus. Amen. All right, well, as it says up here on the slide, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 21 for today. And so if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them up to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 21. It's going to be the passage that we're looking at, and this is going to actually continue our overall narrative of the book of 1 Samuel, which we actually began a couple of months ago, but... We actually have taken about a month-long break since we were last in this book, and therefore, because of that, allow me to just briefly bring us up to speed with what we have seen thus far. Again, all we've really looked at is the first chapter and the first part of chapter 2, but nevertheless, we have seen at this point in Israel's history that Israel itself, as a nation, is not doing it too great. Uh, they are doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, we learn in Judges chapter 13, verse 1, which we noted uh, that the time period of Judges 13 to 16 actually chronologically takes place at around the same time that 1 Samuel's beginning. And we learn there that Israel is doing evil in the sight of the Lord, and so God has handed them over to the Philistines to be oppressed and judged. So that's kind of the background context information of what's happening at this time in Israel. And in that context, we are then introduced to an overall faithful family uh, by the name of Elkanah and Hannah. And we're told that they, every single year, would go to Shiloh, because that's where the tabernacle was, and they would offer the sacrifices unto the Lord, as the law of God told them to do. So they were a family that was very conscious of obeying the law of God. And uh, while they did that, we're also then informed that uh, Hannah was buried, that she was not able to have any children, and this was very grievous to her, and it was made all the more grievous by Elkanah's second wife, Penina, who then grievously provoked her every year, it says, year after year, really rubbing it in her face that she could not have any children. So that was really bad, and this disturbed Hannah very much, so that on one of the occasions, when they're in Shiloh, she goes to the tabernacle and pleads unto the Lord for mercy that God would grant to her a son. And she then makes a vow in the context of that prayer that she would then offer back to the Lord her son if the Lord should so grant her request. And then sure enough, uh, the Lord answers her request, she conceives, he opens her womb, she has a son, they name him Samuel, and so then true to her vow, when he was about three years old and he had been completely weak, she brings him to Shiloh, to the tabernacle, presents him to Eli the priest to then serve there for the rest of his life as a Nazarite. And then, in chapter 2, uh, we saw that she then sings a song of praise unto the Lord, uh, particularly praising God for the great reversals that he accomplishes in the world, and the great reversal that he had done for her personally, of reversing her barrenness into fruitfulness. And then the last thing we saw before we had taken our break, in chapter 2, verse 11, was that Elkanah and Manhattan went home to their place in Ramah, and the boy, Samuel, was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. So we just kind of leave off, you know, just looking at Samuel there in Shiloh. And that's where our text is going to then pick up for this morning. So, if you please rise as we read the text together. Again, it is chapter 2, verses 12 through 21. This is the word of the Lord. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice... The priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the pork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burnt, the priest's servant 
would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish. If they said that, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young man was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Thus ends the reading of God's word. May you write it on our hearts by faith. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so that is the passage of scripture that we're going to be looking at for this morning. And uh, again, this is going to be continuing the overall narrative of where we left off from about a month ago. And uh, it is going to be continuing it, particularly by honing in, as we said, uh, to the events as they are happening in Shiloh at the Tabernacle of the Lord. And uh, we also noted a little bit ago that Israel as a whole is in a state of apostasy. Uh, they are doing evil in the sight of the Lord. That's kind of the overall context of what's happening at this time. And in this text that we just read, we actually begin to see evidences of how that is the case particularly with the priesthood itself. We're going to see how the priesthood at this time has become corrupt, and they are not doing what God desires of them to do. All right? So really, that's kind of the crux of what we're going to see in this passage, and we're going to see that contrasted with how Samuel is conducting himself in, that, in this time period as well. So, like usual, what we will now do is we will simply walk through the text verse by verse and unpack it a little bit further, and then after that we will apply it to our life today. So, we will begin in verse 12, that's where the text began for this morning, and it said, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Alright, so, again, as we have just been emphasizing, uh, things in Israel are not going great, and we see that that is true even at the highest level uh, in the priesthood itself. Such that Eli's two sons, who were actually introduced to us back in chapter 1, verse 3, the names were Hophni and Phinehas, uh, that these two sons are, we're told right off the bat, they're worthless men. They're not good at all, in the sense that they did not know the Lord. Now, when it describes them as worthless men, uh, the word in Hebrew that is word used here is Belial, which, uh, you know, the further it went on, actually kind of, you might know it more as Belial, or Belial, as it is sometimes pronounced. And the word itself literally means worthless, hence why they translate it, they're, they're worthless men. Um, but it was actually such a strong denunciation, this word itself was so strong, that over the course of time, the name Belial actually kind of took on a, a proper name status for Satan himself. So that people would start to refer to Satan as Belial. Uh, and we see this actually, uh, ex uh, an example of it, in 2 Corinthians 6.15, when the Apostle Paul in the New Testament says, What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer have with an unbeliever? All right, so Paul, in this passage, is just kind of making some contrasts. And he actually contrasts Christ with Belial. Right? What, what, what core does Christ have with worthlessness? Right? So again, the, the word Belial actually took on the proper name for Satan himself. Right? What core does Christ have with Belial or with Satan? Nothing. And so, all that to say, Belial became synonymous with Satan, the very father of unbelievers. And so therefore, when it says that Eli had worthless sons... Uh, essentially what this is again emphasizing is that they are sons of the devil themselves. Which again is highlighting how bad things have gotten at this point in Israel. That the priests, the very ones who are supposed to be leading the people of God uh, in the law, teaching people the law, administering the sacrifices of the Lord according to the law, leading the worship of the Lord. That are the ones who are supposed to be leading the charge, and they are worthless men. They're sons of the devil. They don't even know the Lord. Okay? 
Which again does not mean that intellectually they, they just they were, you know, blissfully ignorant of I didn't know what I was supposed to do. No, they, they knew what they were supposed to do. But when it says they did not know the Lord, uh, that is to say they had no regard for the Lord. They just didn't care about his law whatsoever. Okay? So things are not good. And then in the next couple of verses, we actually get examples of what this looked like. So what did their worthlessness entail? Verse 13 and 14, it begins by saying that the custom of the priests with the people at this time was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Okay? So this is the first thing that's actually told to us, again, in the context of displaying the worthlessness of Hophni and Phinehas. So we're told that when the people of Israel came to Shiloh in order to offer the sacrifices, as they were supposed to do, what they would do, the priests, is actually they would send their servants, and when the sacrifices of the meat was boiling in its pan, kettle, cauldron, or pot, whatever the situation may be, they would take a three-pronged fork, they thrust it in there, into where all the meat was, and whatever the fork brought out, that's what the priests would take for themselves. Right? It says this has become the custom of the priests at this time. Alright? Now, on the surface of it, that might not seem so bad. And, uh, and as some of you may know, the Levites and the priests were supposed to get their meat from the sacrifices. This is where they would get their portions from. Okay? However, the only problem with all of this is that there's nothing in the law of God whatsoever about using a three-pronged fork in order to actually get their portion. Okay? But on the contrary, it tells us very clearly in Leviticus 7, which they would have been fully aware of, because this is their Levites, they are going through the book of Leviticus a lot. They knew it by heart. They know what the process is. They know the proper protocol at this time. And in Leviticus 7, it tells us that, for one, they were not to take the fat portions. The fat portions were always offered first. That belonged to the Lord. That was considered the best portion. Don't. You do not take that. That belongs to God. And then, you will not take any of the meat with the blood in it. That was also forbidden. Okay? And then after you made sure that that was done, it says the priest simply received the portion of the breast or the right thigh. And in Leviticus, or Deuteronomy 18.3, it also says at times they were allowed to have the shoulder or the stomach or the cheeks. So I'm not sure how good the cheeks or the stomach would have tasted or what they would have necessarily used that for, but those are the portions that the law says they were allowed to have. It says, it doesn't tell us, to, you know, to, there's nothing in the law about using a three-pronged fork to just kind of add lottery style, just see what you're going to get that day, but rather it specifically says, no, you get the breast or the right uh, thigh or the shoulder or the stomach or the cheeks. And so that's what you're supposed to do, and here we see that they're not doing that whatsoever. They're just, they're just kind of randomly taking whatever they get, okay? So that's the first actual grievance that they are doing, because then, in verse 15, it begins by saying, moreover, which again implies not only is that bad, right, but it goes on. It says, moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. All right, so, again, not only has Hophni and Phinehas invented this new way to get their portion, right, and if they're not the ones who actually came up with this system, if it had been invented before them, they're certainly running along with it. And so not only are they doing that, but then it also says that uh, before the sacrifices were even fully offered, they were uh, demanding it raw, which implies that it was with the blood, and they were doing it before the fat was burned, which again, as we noted from Leviticus 7, very clearly, both of these things were violations. You were not to take it raw with the blood, and you were not to do it before the fat was offered, right? This was a violation. You can't do that. But this is how they're demanding it to be done. They said, no, this is how we're doing it. And this was actually so clear to many of the people that even the average layperson who is making the sacrifice, when they would try to object by saying, you know, the law says we're supposed to burn the fat first, you're like, let's burn the fat first, and then they would say, then you can take whatever you want, right? They're trying to, you know, get some semblance of the law back in it, and if that was offered to them, then as we saw, the priests would simply refuse. They said, no, we're going to take it by force if you don't give it to us the way we want it. 
right? And so that is what's happening at this time with Hophni and Phineas leading the way. They are, as we see, uh, just they've made up this whole new system of getting their meat, and they were taking it with the blood, and they were taking it before the fat was even burned. And if anybody tried to object and say, hey, this is not how we're supposed to do it, they would get violent and threaten to use force to get their own way. And so, we get to see in verse 17, the divinely inspired commentary from God's point of view. How does God think about, what does God think of this? Verse 17, it says, Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. So there it is. Very clearly, what is God, when God looks down and he sees his priests not doing at all what his law says to actually do in these contexts, he doesn't just... You know, look down and not care. Right? He's not like those guys. What am I going to do with that? You know, like that's just that's just not his mindset. But rather, it tells us he says this sin is very great. It's not just great. This is very great in the sight of the Lord because they're treating the offering with contempt. Right? This is what, this is what God thinks of it when you have just absolutely no regard for what He says when it comes, in, particularly in the context of worship. When you just kind of make it up and you're doing your own thing, He sees that. He says. That's a great sin. You're treating my offering with contempt. Absolutely vile. And we're going to see, in, not today, but in the weeks to come, uh, what the Lord is actually going to do to Hophni and Phineas as a result of their uh, wickedness here. Right? But that's, that's kind of the first part of what we see here in the walkthrough of the text. But after highlighting now the wickedness of Hophni and Phineas on the one hand, the text now transitions to the faithfulness of Samuel, who is ministering during this time as a youth on the other. We see that in verse 18 and following. It says, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman. For the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Alright, again. So here we see in stark contrast to the wickedness of Hophni and Phinehas, we are now introduced to the boy Samuel. Once again, we're not introduced, but we're, we're brought to him. And it says that he is, in fact, ministering before the Lord properly. Okay? And this is actually the common refrain now that we have seen thus far from Samuel. Back in chapter 1, verse 28, it told us that he was worshiping the Lord at this time. Chapter 2, verse 11, tells us that Samuel was ministering to the Lord. And now here in chapter 2, verse 18, it says he is ministering before the Lord. Every time we're introduced to Samuel, it's always in the context of how he is properly worshiping and ministering before the Lord, which again is a good bit of, bit of foreshadowing to indicate that he is going to be a man who worships and pro uh, properly ministers to the Lord all the days of his life. And so that's what he's doing in the context of him doing that. It says he was dressed in a little uh, linen ephod, which was a priestly garment, and a little robe that his mother would make for him uh, every year that uh, she would then make. She would come on a yearly basis, because he, again, he was brought there at around three. So when he came next year at four, he's got this little robe, and then she would come in at age five, another little robe, and she would just perpetually do that. Which, uh, just as a complete side note, I, again, I just find this, uh, this image itself just kind of humorous. Uh, again, when you've got the context of Hoffman and Phineas doing wicked things, and we'll see even more wicked things next week, which is not funny. But then, in the context of all of this, you got, you know, this little boy Samuel, just, you can just kind of picture with his little linen ephod and a little robe, just walking around the tabernacle, just doing all of his priestly duties. Uh, I just, I think of, it just, again, just picture, you know, our three, four, five, six-year-old kids in the church, just walking around the church, doing, like, pastoral responsibilities with little robes on. I think it would be uh, a sight for you and that's what's happening in this context uh, with Samuel. He is properly ministering to the Lord the way he is supposed to. And when his parents would visit on the yearly basis, we're told that Eli would then bless Elkanah and his wife. And the blessing that he particularly bestows to them is for Hannah to increase in fruitfulness. Uh, particularly in light of the fact that she had made her petition. In light of the fact that she made her vow to offer back her son to Samuel, and she kept that vow, right? In light of that, Eli is now petitioning on their behalf before the Lord and asking for God's blessing to now go back to Hannah so that she would continue to be able to have children, right? That's the blessing that he pronounces. 
And verse 21, the last verse of our text today, it says, Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. So, God, in his great mercy, uh, answers the petition of Eli, the high priest at this time, such that Hannah does conceive and bear more children, despite the fact that for the longest time she had been barren. And so she has three more sons and two more daughters. Okay? So she had been barren. Uh, the Lord mercifully opens her womb the first time. In that, in that context, she had promised to give the son back to the Lord. And then, in light of all of that, the Lord then blesses her back with five more children. Right? Which, as another little side note, is one of those patterns that we actually see all throughout the Bible, which is very encouraging and that we should take to heart, which is the idea that when we, in faith, truly offer unto the Lord uh, you know, our gifts and, and that which He has called us to give, the Lord very frequently loves to take those gifts that we have offered in faith and to then multiply them and to then give them back to us. Right? It is really an amazing thing that the Lord so often does that we see. Uh, so for again instance, um, in the time of Elijah, we see that the widow at Zarephath, uh, there's the famine, you know, there's no rain for you know, a couple of years at this point. Great famine, great drought, they've got virtually no food, it's just the, the, the woman, the widow, and uh, her son. And they've got virtually no food, Elijah comes and asks for a bit of food first. And they've, they've got almost no nothing, right? And so, like, basically, in faith, she had to give him this last meal that they basically had. And so she does, in faith, offer this meal. And then the Lord ensures that for the duration of the famine, she would be taken care of, right? He took her gift of faith, multiplied it, and then gave it right back. Uh, we see this in the book of Malachi. God promises that when we give our tithe, our 10% of what he has first given us, he will open the storehouses of heaven and unload his blessings upon us. Uh, Jesus says that when we sacrifice our possessions for the sake of the gospel, then we will receive back, not only in this life, a hundredfold, but in the age to come, eternal life, it says in Mark chapter 10. And now we've got this passage where Hannah gives unto the Lord her one and only son that she was able to have at this point, and the Lord blesses that, and then makes her womb quintuply fruitful, and then gives five children back to her. And so we see this pattern all throughout the scripture, which is very encouraging for us to remember, that God delights to take our gifts that we offer in faith, to multiply it, and to actually then give it back. Which, as like a side note to that, uh, this is actually a, a, a principle that we see, or a pattern that we see, that many uh, Christians actually sometimes are almost hesitant to want to believe, and it's one that many teachers and preachers are actually afraid to sort of expound upon, because of how it has been tainted by prosperity preachers. And because of how televangelists, you'll perhaps see on TV, you know, insisting that if you sow in your faith seed money of $100, then God will give it back to you a hundredfold, and you'll have health, wealth, prosperity, success, and everything else you could ever hope for in your life. And you see this kind of thing, and therefore we're just kind of turned off to it, and we just want to, like, you know, go the exact opposite end and not even have any sort of idea of, you know, having that in our mindset. Right? And so... On that case, right, the prosperity preachers are wrong. They are, what they're doing is wicked because ultimately what they're actually doing is they have elevated money and prosperity to be their God. That's the actual God they're serving. And they're using the true and living God as a means to try and get what they actually want. Right? That's what they're doing. And then they will prey on, you know, gullible people who, you know, otherwise, you know, would want to, you know, use biblical language to try and make it seem like if you just do this, then God will automatically give it back. And so what they're doing is deception and wicked and it's wrong because they're actually serving money as their God. Okay? So while we acknowledge that that's a real thing, at the same time, we don't want to then just dismiss the, the pattern that we see and the principles that we see that when we give in faith, not just like an automatic vending machine type mentality of I give this, you have to give it back, uh, but when we give in faith, the Lord nevertheless does delight to multiply and give it back to us. Uh, we even see this in Proverbs 11, verse 24 and 25, when God says, or when this Proverbs says, in hey, my God, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give, and only suffers once. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. So again, like if we live in just a completely atheistic worldview, like if it's just there's no God, there's no spiritual realities, it's just matter in motion, then logically the most wise thing to do is to just keep everything you get, because then you would just 
get more and more and more. And people would, you know, have the idea, well, you should be generous, but if it's just an atheistic world, then that actually doesn't, that, why would, why would you? <laughs> you could, you just get more and more and just be very secure. Okay? In fact, if we live in an atheistic world, that would be the natural course of action, but we obviously do not live in an atheistic world, but rather we live in a blessedly god rigged world. God is actively governing over everything. He sees everything, and he will see to it. I mean, he, he gives us blessed uh, proverbs like this to show us how he is going to operate in the world that he has created. So that if you give freely in faith, right, not just like some being duped by it and thinking you have to automatically get it back like prosperity preachers say, but when you give freely in faith, God will ensure that you are blessed by that. And, on the contrary, if you just withhold everything you have, well then God will see to it that you will often suffer want as a result. Right? This is the universe that God created, and this is the way God said He's going to make it operate. And so, this is something we should take heart, take to heart, and this is what, again what we see in our text in today. Right? Hannah gave her son in faith, and then God gave it back with five more children. And that's actually the last time we're ever going to see Elkanah or Hannah in the narrative of events. But we leave off knowing that uh, Hannah now has a bustling household of children uh, as a perpetual testament of God's faithfulness to her, to uh, and, and all that she has done and, and the vow that she has made. So that's encouraging to know that. Well, all that to say, that actually brings us, as I said, to the end of where we're going for today. And so by way of recap, what we see in this text is that... Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, have corrupted the worship of God, and they are not conducting themselves in accordance with God's law. And um, in contrast to that, we then saw that Samuel is growing and ministering unto the Lord properly. He is visited by his family on a yearly basis, and his family is then blessed with increased fruitfulness. And very interesting, that's what we see in the passage. And so, having looked at all of that, we can now transition into our point of application. And to do that, what I would actually like to do, particularly for the remainder of our time, is to actually hone back in, especially on the first point of what we were looking at, and to examine a little bit further uh, what Hophni and Phineas were doing. And uh, in light of what they were doing, I would like to just extend the application, ultimately in the form of a warning. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to basically, again, just look a little bit more what were Hophni and Phineas doing. And obviously it was a bad thing they were doing. It's a negative example. And so learn from their negative example to then, therefore, not do the same things they were doing in our context today. Okay? So the application comes in the form of two warnings. Right? Here it is. Number one, beware of altering God's prescribed way of worshiping Him. And beware of trying to make the worship of God revolve around you and me. Right? Us. Right? This is what we should be very careful of doing. Beware of altering God's prescribed way of worshiping Him. And be very careful in the, while you're doing that, not to just make it ultimately revolve around us. Right here. This is what we see Hophni and Phineas do in our text. Again, as we saw. We saw that they used a three-pronged fork to get their meat, which was not the way the law of God said for them to get it. And verse 15 again said, Moreover, again implying not only was that bad, but they were taking their portion before the fat was burnt, which was again contrary to the law. And some commentators suggest that in so doing, what that actually implies is that they were taking the fat portions for themselves, potentially. So they're taking God's portion, the portion that belonged to God, and they're taking that for themselves, very likely. And they took the meat while raw, which means, means it had the blood, which again is prohibited in the law. So they're not doing anything God's law actually says when it comes to doing the sacrifices properly. And again, if anybody tried to correct them or confront them, they would get violent and threaten to use force to get their own way so as to serve their own purposes. This is what they were doing, and we saw, once again, the way God views all of this in verse 17. It says that the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt, as we saw. Okay? It's a very great sin, they're treating it with contempt, this is very bad. Which again simply highlights to us something that we likely already know, but we see very clearly. God takes the worship of himself very, very seriously. And therefore we should likewise be taking the worship of God very seriously. We do not have the authority to alter or to edit what God has said to do. And we do not have the authority to then kind of just make up new methods of doing what God has said to do. Even if those new methods, on the surface of it, aren't inherently sinful. 
And this is something that's important to understand because somebody could have theoretically, you know, appealed to the fact that three-pronged forks in and of themselves are not sinful. Like, it's not wrong to use a three-pronged fork in other contexts. It's not wrong to grab meat with a three-pronged fork in other contexts, right? So, on the surface, this is not a sinful act. Uh, and so, they, the logic of some would have been maybe like, well, it's not sinful, therefore it should be okay to do this. And yet it wasn't okay, God called it a great sin, because they're not doing what God said to do when it came to worship. Which again means that God takes worship very seriously, and this is just a very important thing for us to grasp as Christians today, because there, there is a tendency amongst many otherwise well-meaning evangelicals today, who uh, they, they just have this idea that... that the worship isn't that serious of a thing. There's like this mindset that um, God was really serious in the Old Testament. It's very common that when you talk to people, like, God was very particular in the Old Testament. He, he wanted this kind of sacrifice and use this kind of animal and make sure the priests were wearing this. And make sure you wave the offering like this before you do it. And when you cut it up, make sure you throw the guts on this side of the altar. Make sure you use this kind of fire and not that kind of fire. And, and it's very particular, like lots and lots of details, entire books of the Bible to, devoted to this is how you do it, this is how you do it. It's very particular. And then, right, when we get to the New Covenant, a lot of believers today just think that God has just done a complete 180. Like, now he's just super laid back. Now he, like, he doesn't care at all how the worship of him goes. Now he loves spontaneity more than anything. Now he just, like, the highest value that he has is for us to be comfortable. The highest value is, you know, just come as you are. There's no structure here. Uh, you know, he will accept your worship really however you offer it. Uh, as long as it's not, you know, super simple, usually they would add that. And as long as your heart is in the right place, right? As long as that's there, well, then God will basically accept you no matter what you do. And I would simply contend that that's actually not the picture that we get in Scripture, whether it's in the Old Covenant or in the New Covenant, whether it was in the ancient days of old or whether it's in 21st century America today, uh, worship is actually... For one, I should note, is to be highly joyous, so I don't want to have this idea that because it's serious, that it's therefore just doom and gloom, sour and dour, you should just, it should be like a really, it, that's not, that's not the actual mindset. It's not supposed to be like this heavy, you know, like bad thing. It's supposed to be highly joyous, but at the same time, it is supposed to be, as we see very clearly in the book of Hebrews, it is to be marked by a holy fear of God. It is to be marked by reverence. Worship is to be very reverent. And it is supposed to be structured and even regimented. Right? So the idea of worship should not just be sort of free-flowing, sort of just kind of making it up as you go, kind of keeping things different all the time. It's actually supposed to be structured and regimented. As we see in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says, For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So Paul, at this point, to the Colossian church, commends their church for the good order that they display. And interestingly, that word order in the Greek is the word toxis, which was actually a military term at the time to describe a well-ordered army. Like, that was like the term that was used to describe this well-structured army. So you can picture an army, not just like this big conglomerate mass of, you know, random people all standing around, but a well-regimented, all in rank and file, all marching to the same beat, all, you know, in their place. That's the kind of word, like that word is what this portrays. And that's the word Paul uses to describe the church. The church should be like that, that kind of structure. He says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 14.40, in the context of worship, he says, but all things are to be done decently and in order. Again, same word for order is toxic. It should be like this well-regimented military. That's, he actually says, what worship is supposed to look like. And so worship is not a follow your heart, do what seems right kind of thing, but rather it is a uh, disciplined and regimented, do what the Bible says and nothing else kind of thing. And so, we would do well to heed the warning of Numbers, chapter 15, verse 39 to 40, in all of life, but then especially as it comes to worship, which says, at a time when God actually commanded them to wear tassels on their garments, uh, it says, it shall be a tassel for you to look at and to remember all the commandments of the Lord, to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. Okay? So just, again, mark it down. 
like whether we're talking about ancient Israel or modern times today, our inclination, as it says here, is to just want to follow our own hearts. It's not want to follow our own eyes, seeing what seems good to us. In fact, this is what is being like catechized to us and our children all the time, especially through Disney. This is like Disney's whole, you know, thing. Follow your heart. Your heart will not lead you astray. Whatever your heart is saying, that should probably be good. That's going to be a good guide. And and the Lord Himself is very. He's not mincing words. He says, if you just decide to follow your own heart, you're chasing after a horse. Okay? Like, in other words, not good. Don't do that. Okay. But that is the inclination that we are tempted to do. Uh, so again, for instance, it's, it's, it's this idea that I'm going to offer the fruit instead of the, the meat, like my brother Abel says, can it, like it, it shouldn't matter. Really not. The Lord will accept either one. Or it'll be like saying uh, for Nadab and Abihu, we're going to offer it with this fire instead of that fire. The sacrifices have to be burned one way or the other. We're going to use this fire instead of that fire, and contrary to what God said. Or, like Uzzah, you know, he says, I'm going to carry the ark on this cart, instead of using the poles, like it says. I know, I mean, like, but we need to bring the ark back some way, so, like, let's just use this cart here. Or, like King Uzziah say, I'm going to go into the temple to burn incense. I know technically only the priests are supposed to go in the temple, but, I mean, I'm a believer of the Lord. Offering incense is a good thing. I think it should be okay. Or, I'm going to use this three-pronged fork to get my meat. Uh, and, and eat that, right? I know the Lord said I'm supposed to just get these portions, but we're going to do it this way. I mean, what harm could that be? Emeralds are going to take the fat and the raw meat as well. But, you know, the Lord wants us to be eating good things too, so I'm going to take those portions, right? And on and on and on it goes, right? This is always the tendency that we can have. And on the surface of it, again, all of those examples we could look at, and we might not think of them as being huge offenses. The idea of, you know, like offering fruit instead of meat. The idea of offering this fire instead of that fire. The idea of using a cart instead of the poles. The idea of going into the temple even when you weren't a priest. The idea of using a fork to grab your meat. All of those things on the surface doesn't seem like, whoa, that's real bad. Like, I can't believe they did that. It doesn't seem like that. And yet, Cain was rejected. Nadab, Abihu, and Uzzah were struck dead on the spot. Uh, King Uzziah was plagued with leprosy for the rest of his life, and Hophni and Phinehas, as we said, are going to be put to death by God very shortly for this breach of covenant. Again, why? Because they violated God's instructions regarding how the worship was supposed to be done. And so, God takes all sin very seriously. But this, again, is one of those patterns that we see frequently in the scripture, is that the closer you get to the very heart of the worship, uh, the more serious God actually seems to get with his commands and with his punishments as well. And because God takes the worship of himself very seriously. And so, do not just follow after your own heart, but rather do what the commandments say. Like, that's just how our mindset should be geared for. And, again, lastly, as we were saying at the beginning, or at the beginning of the application, beware of trying to then ultimately revolve it around what would just be most convenient or best for you, because remember, the worship that we're offering is not primarily for us, but the worship that we're offering is worshiping, or we're offering it unto Christ. Like, that's who we're offering it to, and so we are to then do it in accordance to how he said to do it. We're to do it so that he would be most pleased, not so that we would be ultimately most pleased. So it's, again, worship is not about, you know, organizing it to be around our personal preferences, styles, or what we even think would be most accommodating for people, but what does God say to do? That's what we're going to do, because we do trust that God knows what he's talking about, and we trust that his commands are good. And so, that's why, just by the way, we do things like confess our sins, we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, we profess our faith unto the Lord, we read scripture, that's why we stand for the reading of scripture, that's why we teach and preach and try to give the meaning of the scriptures, uh, it's why we... Observe communion, it's why we now use the elements that Christ explicitly told us to use of bread and wine, it's why we raise our hands for the doxology even, it's why we do these things, because this is what we see in scripture commanding us to do in worship. And even the order that we do it all in matters and is intentional as we've covered in previous times as well. It's, it's all purposeful in accordance to fit with what scripture commands us to do. And so... All that to say, that's what that's the application. That's, this is what we should be aware of doing so that we do not commit the sin of Hophni and Phineas and thus treat the worship of God with contempt. That's right.
Father God, we do thank you and praise you for, first off, giving us the great privilege to worship you in the first place. That you would make, uh, Lord, make it possible for us to come into your presence every single week for this corporate worship and to, and to be in your very presence in, with the, the innumerable host of angels, with Christ, with you, uh, with the Holy Spirit drawing us unto yourself, with, uh, Lord, Lord, this is just absolutely incredible to behold, that we have this ability, and so God, because of this great, great privilege, we ask that you would now uh, help us and convict our hearts to then uh, come to you in worship the way you told us to come to you in worship. And that we would do that which you required of us to do, and that we would not take liberties and just begin to make things up, or begin to just kind of uh, just just go all spontan spontaneous and just uh, just Lord guard us from these ten tendencies and guard us from the mindset of just trying to make worship all about us and about what we want and about our preferences and our styles and everything else, Lord. Uh, help us guard our hearts from that inclination, from that tendency to just follow after our own hearts. Lord, we do not want to do this. We do not want to sin against you. We do not want to commit the sin of Hophni and Phinehas. Uh, and so, Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word uh, that reveals to us how we're supposed to come. And so help us to now do this. And we thank you, Lord, that when we come in faith, we can come with incredible joy because we're coming unto you. And we are offering our worship unto you. And so, God, we thank you for this. Please help us to do it uh, faithfully going forward. We ask it in the good name of Christ. Amen. The charge for this morning is in Luke 6.46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Which tells us that in, even in Jesus' day, there were people who would profess faith in him and say, Lord, Lord, but when it came to it, they didn't actually do what he said to do. They didn't actually obey him. And so, let us beware of that in every area of life, uh, but in light of today's passage, let us especially be aware of that in worship. Proclaiming Christ as Lord, but then not worshiping Him the way He told us to worship Him, and instead making it about us or our desires or our preferences. To do this is to treat God's worship with contempt and is a great sin in God's sight. And so let us beware of this and instead worship God in accordance with Scripture and so glorify the Lord. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Amen. Amen. Amen.